It is 6.30, so I don't see anyone in the waiting room right now. Whenever you're ready, Catherine, um, I'm good when you are. So okay. we can get started. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar this evening uh, to talk about rain barrels. Uh, and this is the first time that we're been offering this. And so I'm really excited to share what, what I know about rain barrels with you guys and take any type of questions you guys have at the, the end. A couple um, housekeeping comments to make. If, if you could, if you haven't already, could you please turn off the, the video um, for on your end um, just to keep our bandwidth really nice here? Um, and plus, who, who really wants to have their video projected if nobody else is also sharing as well? Of course, I, I'm going to be here. So, um, and I'll probably reiterate these a couple times if more people join in late. So, um, okay, so thank you. I can see you guys already did that. Everyone's on mute right now. Um, at the end of, of the presentation, definitely open to any type of questions you guys have. Well, we can unmute at that point in time. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation, um, and they're kind of shorter questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. And if I do notice them, I can try to address them during the presentation. Otherwise, uh, there'll definitely be opportunity at the end of the presentation for that. Um, and so I see we have a, a couple people that joined just recently. I just want to uh, reiterate a couple housekeeping things. If you could turn off your video for this presentation just to help us with our bandwidth, um, that would be great. Okay. So, um, I'm Catherine Dalkani. I'm a master water steward. I'll explain a little bit about what that is towards the end of the presentation. And um, I'm giving this presentation as part of a capstone project for this uh, master water steward program that I went through. Um, and so I'm really excited to give this to you guys, but I'm gonna first pass it over to Nick Voss uh, so we can talk a little bit to you guys about what BAMO is, uh, which is the organization that is sponsoring this webinar. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I am Education Outreach Coordinator here at Blamo. We are a 24 square mile watershed and we do a bunch of things for the water resources. It includes water monitoring. We do uh, lake planning, wetland planning uh, projects and uh, develop, developing projects to improve, protect our lakes and wetlands. We have a cost share program, which you'll hear about later in the presentation. And uh, my focus is education and outreach. So. Uh, we have a growing team of master water stewards who go through the training that uh, Catherine's going to talk about. And then we, we become this team of uh, folks that pick our special interests. And then I, I support folks uh, to carry that out and uh, put on an event like this, of course, accommodating for our strange uh, pandemic circumstances. So yeah, um, that's our range. Um, from Lionel Lakes to Radness Heights, a little bit of White Bear Lake, um, the area we cover. So next slide. Uh, this is an extreme example of uh, surface runoff on lawns. Um, I show it just because uh, all the water running off into this gully is coming from multiple households upstream. So you can see water on the back, um, draining, dripping off of the roof, off of that uh, grayish blue house. And, you know, every house that's doing a little bit to perhaps capture some of that um, is adding to the bigger connection, which as you see is the storm drain. Uh, storm drains connect directly to our lakes and wetlands. And uh, next slide. Um, that's where we uh, pay attention to what's happening on in our lakes, uh, stormwater runoff uh, impacts uh, our lakes and wetlands uh, in often a negative way. So this is just a sample of the lake data we have. Um, the high bars uh, in yellow are lakes that are not healthy. Right now in the summer, they're, they're green. They look like they're a little sick. Uh, they might have a stomach ache. Um, chlorophyll is the green bar. And um, lakes that are above the state standard are what we call impaired. Uh, then on the right, there's Birch and Black Lake. Those are actually really clean lakes. They're doing great, they're healthy, they have clean water, and that clean water is uh, 
uh, you know, going to the next lake in the watershed, uh, they connect to somewhere else. So that's just our focus of how everything's connected. And uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I might have a delay. Sorry, I hit it. <laughs> but, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, and uh, we have more volunteer opportunities um, beyond the Master Water Stewards program. So um, every some Saturday in September, uh, we're, we're trying out some social distance uh, accommodations um, to remove buckthorn here at the Venice City Hall. That'll be every Friday from 10.30 a.m. to about noon. Uh, those events are on our website. Um, in non-pandemic times, there's a range of things on the web, uh, how to be involved and how to uh, help out. So that's at vlamo.org slash get involved. Um, next slide. Um, a pitch for our current summer programming. Uh, when the pandemic started, we started making more videos and being a little more intentional about education media. Um, tomorrow we have our next edition of Floodplain Friday coming out. Uh, so we started this hashtag called Floodplain Friday. Every video is a little story about floodplains and water resources, storage, um, soil, native plants, um, good stuff like that. So lots to talk about there, but uh, encourage everybody to check it out and join in with that hashtag. We'll try to make that grow and uh, spark some good discussion. Um, so with that, there's one more, I think. Next slide. Uh, we've got our YouTube, Twitter, Facebook pages. You know, uh, I try to keep them updated with events and happenings. Um, we've got a email newsletter, social media. We've got a, a blog on our website. So even if you're not in our watershed, if you're in St. Paul or Minneapolis, um, you're definitely welcome to uh, follow along and um, we'll relate to what a lot of the other watersheds and places in the metro are also uh, focused on. So yeah, that's all my pitch. Uh, thank you for letting me include that, Catherine, and uh, I'll hand it over. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I, I want to give a little brief introduction about who I am. Uh, so I'm Catherine Belcani. I'm um, recently I've finished uh, semester water steward training. Um, I also was part of a water conservation advisor training cohort as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the master water steward program is um, towards the end of the presentation. But um, on a very high level, I'll just say that we're very interested in clean water and we try to it's the program is meant to train people to be community leaders to help get, engage people and get them interested in achieving clean water. Um, I also am a rain garden and a Minnesota native plant aficionado. And it was really only, I'd say probably actually just this summer that I really became interested in rain barrels. And I'm very excited to present to you guys about what I've learned. And, um, and I'm excited that you guys are interested in potentially incorporating rain barrels in your guys' own yards. So what does this presentation cover? Um, so at the high level, just so you guys have an idea of what the flow is going to be for this presentation. I'll tell you about what is a rain barrel and how you can install one and uh, do some customization based off of what you're looking for it to achieve. Um, there's issues to watch for when you're installing rain barrels. So I'll talk about a, a couple of those um, so they're on your radar. Um, some general uh, maintenance and winterization. Unfortunately, with those Minnesota winters, uh, we, we get extra steps to take care of our rain barrels to keep them working year after year. And then, um, because you guys are interested in rain barrels, I hope that you guys are also interested in water conservation in general. And so I'm going to just give a, a few tips about um, saving water in the home. And then um, to go back to just talking about other ways that you guys can contribute to clean water beyond just rain barrels. So um, what is a rain barrel? I have a picture here. Uh, somebody has a very beautiful, um, probably uh, it could have been a prior wine or uh, alcohol storing container, or it could just be a very nice decorative rain barrel, but um, they're using it here and um, probably using it for these beautiful plants. So what is this, uh, this rain barrel? Um, okay, let me click here. What is a rain barrel? So a rain barrel is used to collect uh, rainwater from a catchment surface. In most cases, this is going to be a roof. Uh, for most of us here, this is a house roof. 
is usually how you guys are going to use this. Um, you'll use a collection system, which is usually a gutter system to help um, gravity direct that rain barrel, rain water into your rain barrel. Um, you usually will have screens at at least one, but sometimes multiple points along the way to collect debris. Otherwise, you're going to get things like your leaves. Um, you will still get stuff even with your best intentions of a filter system, but um, the way that you minimize it is is through filtration as best as you can. So that is a high level what a rain barrel is. But so you capture all this water. Well, now you're going to want to use it. So what are some of the high level um, distribution methods people use? Uh, they can use a spigot at the bottom of the barrel. I'm showing a couple of pictures here where you can see a couple of examples of rain barrels. These are actually on my property. And you can see at the very um, bottom, they have spigots. Um, that way you can have, once the water is collected in there, um, the gravity, the force of the water obviously will drain out from the bottom. I can use that to fill a watering can or I can use that um, to feed your garden hoses. So the example on the left, I actually primarily use those rain barrels. Um, I use them with hoses and I've planted a lot of shrubs in my front yard recently. And so I actually use gravity feed um, to water shrubs in my front yard through garden hoses. On the right side, those rain barrels, I typically will fill up a watering can and kind of walk around and water select flowers in my yard, but you could also, you know, hook up a hose to that as well. And so those are very common distribution methods. Um, if you are trying to use the water at a much greater distance, um, you might need to incorporate some more sophisticated methods like a pump system or something, but that's not very typical how people tend to use rain barrels. Um, so that is what a rain barrel is. There's many different types of rain barrels. They come in many different sizes based off of you know what you would like to collect for water and how you would plan to use it they can be very um you know pleasing to the eye like uh, these terracotta appearance ones um, that i show here on the left um but also if you're just very interested in functionality and you want to you know maybe do something diy or cheaper or have a lot of barrels um some people will use um recycled food um uh, containers. So the ones at the bottom, those blue ones are probably 55 gallon um, jugs that used to store food products, which cannot be reused. Um, and so they often will end up becoming rain barrels or these are also the things you'll see holding up people's docks um, sometimes at the lake. And so there are many different types of rain barrels. You can pick sizes, different appearances, customize it for your own functionality. So there's a lot of great options with rain barrels. So, well, why do we care about rain barrels? Like, why would we want to collect rainwater? I can just turn on my, you know, faucet and, you know, get water through my garden hose. Well, there's obviously some benefits here. Um, rainwater is, is free of salt, um, of minerals. And obviously when we have our municipal treated water um, that we're getting from our city, um, it can have chemicals in it. Um, they're trying to make it safe for human consumption. And so if you're collecting rainwater, it's going to be free of those types of chemicals. And, you know, our plants don't necessarily need these things. It's probably better for it to not be there. It actually has a very perfect pH balance and nitrate delivery. And one thing that I think is great about rainwater is once you get the system set up, it's free to harvest. It was weird when I was researching this, but there's some states where it's actually not legal to harvest rainwater. Um, that seems a little bit weird, but that's not the case in the state of Minnesota. So it's great that it's free to harvest and because uh, you're harvesting it and it's not your municipal treated water from the city, you can avoid a lot of these seasonal watering restrictions that some cities have, uh, such as the city of Adnes Heights. So I'm an even number house um, and so I wouldn't be able to run sprinklers on odd days, I think it is, but you know, with a rain barrel, I can go out there and water stuff whenever I want from my rain barrels and I don't feel any sort of restrictions or, or I guess, uh, you know, hesitancy to use my rain water uh, whenever I have it. Um, you can reduce your water and sewer utility bills, but I'll be honest with how most people are using rain barrels in their yards, 
you're not likely to see any type of noticeable reduction, but you do get the satisfaction that you're being environmentally friendly. Uh, so that's just some of the benefits of using rainwater versus uh, your you know, municipal treated water. I do want to just put a plug out there that uh, Blamo does offer rain barrel grants if you go to their website with that link there at the bottom. Um, and I just essentially copied and pasted this description from the website about this, but um, you can uh, purchase a couple of rain barrels in Blamo. If you're a Blamo resident or work within the Blamo area, we'll reimburse you 50% of that cost. That's actually how I got my first two rain barrels that I have in my yard. Um, it's a great program and I'm pretty sure that there's probably funds still available in 2020. So if you are hesitating at all about getting a rain barrel, I'd say, you know, give this type of program a shot. Um, so I'll put that plug out there for you guys on that. Um, let's talk about rain barrel installation and a little bit about customization. So, when you are gonna install a rain barrel, you really wanna think first about your site selection uh, because you, know, you want to use this water. There's not really any point to just collecting it and having it sit in a barrel and maybe like periodically draining it. Like you want to have an intention with this. And so it's usually best if you're gonna put it close to the plants you plan to water. Um, that way, you know, it's efficient if you're not hooking up a type of sophisticated pump system to it, you are really only relying on gravity to draw the water out of the barrel. And there's a limit to how, um, how much pressure you really can get from these systems. So you do want them close to the plants that you're going to water. You will typically want to install them near a downspout. Um, you can you know, make your own customizations or modifications to to get away from that, but it's gonna be the easiest install if you put it near a downspout. You can see this individual here in this picture. Um, they could have probably most easily installed their rain barrel if they had it on the other face of the house. Um, however, for some reason they must have wanted it on this other face of the house. And so they have the flexi um, downspout PVC type of tube to help get it there. But you can also, if you wanted to be more elaborate, you could probably draw, you know, make pipes go all the way heading downward using gravity to have it feed to a barrel at a much greater distance away. But, you know, it's not as efficient in that way. So when you're also selecting your site, you need to make sure that you're going to be able to direct the overflow away from your house foundation. So you're now modifying a, um, a downspout that was originally moving water away from your house. If you're going to cut that, make some modifications and put a rain barrel, these rain barrels are going to fill up in most of your rain events. Um, and they will overflow and they need to be set up so that they overflow away from your house foundation or you basically now just created a pretty big problem for yourself. So just make sure you keep that in mind when you're making your site selection that you're making, you're putting this barrel in a place where you're going to be able to direct that water away from the foundation. Also, you're going to want to be able to elevate the rain barrel a little bit. Some people don't, but I would say you should because if you elevate it, you get more gravity, more pressure, and the better ability to move water to, um, to plants a little bit further distance away. And so height is important to consider. Um, this person here put it on blocks. I don't know, maybe those look like six inches elevation. I think I have mine elevated something similar to that height for one of my sets, but my other set of barrels, I think are elevated closer to a foot. You can go higher, um, but you need to be careful to not like obstruct a window or also you don't want to go ridiculously high unless you're being con um, considering the fact that these barrels, when they are filled with water, they're set, they could be up to 400, 500 pounds. Um, so they can be a tip hazard. Just be very careful about your site selection that you're taking this all into consideration. Another thing about installing, I'm just gonna talk very high level about installing what is a very common style of a rain barrel, which would be when you're having a downspout end into the top of a rain barrel. And so it's like a top filled rain barrel. Um, I would say there's many different types of rain barrels on the market. I feel like this is a very common and efficient and very well engineered design for a rain barrel. I have a style that also isn't this style. Um, 
that I have installed at my house, it was much harder to install. So I'm just going to talk about the easy version, um, which is also the style that um, the first 15 registrations uh, will be uh, eligible to get this type of a rain barrel. And so you've already selected your amazing site. Um, I'm hoping oh, because it makes it really easy. At high level, you're just going to remove a section of the downspout. Um, and then you're going to um, really just shortening it and having the water empty into the top of that rain barrel. Um, this there's one particular design that um, is very uh, popular around here and is the one that Brahma was offering out to the first 15 registrants does have a really good overflow mechanism for it too um, to help um, direct away the overflow. Um, okay, and also a big safety tip here, please, wear gloves if you're going to be cutting down spouts. Um, they're very sharp edges, you can cut yourself. Just be careful about it. Um, also, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going through this at high level because I will give these slides to you guys. So I don't wanna just read things to you. I want to provide some relevant information, some context for what's being said here. But after you attach everything, um, you need to then place your rain barrel underneath that down that new downspout modified modified um that you have modified um and it ensure the overflow is direct away from the foundation so once again i'm going to give you guys the slides i'll try not to read everything to you guys and um move on i love to show things as examples instead of illustrations and words and so we're going to go back to the example at my house of this very common rain barrel design that i think is just kind of like engineered to perfection in my opinion. It's the easiest one to install the two different sets I have. So here on the far, far left, um, you can see the area that is catching water on the roof. It's going to the gutters. It's going through the downspout. I had my husband <laughs> cut the downspout for me and um, make the modification to the downspout elbow so that it then uh, drops into the top of this rain barrel. Um, we had made the decision to elevate it a good foot using these concrete patio pavers. Um, we were lucky to actually pick these up for free from somebody on Craigslist that was redoing a patio or something, so they didn't want these blocks anymore. But you can buy these type of things at any type of home improvement store. They can be pretty or they can be honestly just functional, um, like the ones that we have here. And so we have it elevated here, um, more elevation to get a little bit more gravity drawn pressure through the water. Um, and then here's a third picture here showing how the elbow is ending right above the rain barrel top. And then in the final picture to the far right, what I'm trying to show here is if you see those black plastic tubes um, kind of to the right of the barrels leading out away, that's the overflow that's being directed away from the foundation. So the downspout used to go out that direction. Um, it was a good direction to be going because it's going away from the house. And so you need to make sure when you put your installation, your installed barrel or barrels in, that that overflow is moving away from the foundation. Okay, so doubling up barrels, let's talk about um, if you want to install more than one barrel at a site. So I've actually done this with both of my um, rain barrel setups. Um, so here on the left, um, the very nicely engineered rain barrels where it's very, very easy to double up these barrels. Um, what you would do is you actually just in the kind of the middle picture there, if you see those two um, knobs that kind of stick out in the left and the right of the back of the barrel, you literally just cut off that end and then you're gonna attach like a plastic tubing between those two barrels. And then as the first barrel fills up, it's gonna um, reach that you know connector you now put between two barrels and then it'll start filling up the second barrel. Um, and then, you know, if you have it, you know, elevations right between the two barrels, um, you'll only really get your overflow happening once that second barrel has filled up. This is, was super easy to install. Um, I'll be honest, my husband did most of these installs, but I would have been able to do this one pretty easily myself. I'm, I'm, 
I'm a recent first time mother. So I have like a nine week old at home. So I was paranoid about really doing any type of work over the past like year basically, but this is an easy install. This one on the right, oh my gosh, much more complicated. It was the first rain barrel we ever bought. These are the ones that we got using the Bombo grant. Beautiful barrels. I don't regret the purchase at all. Much more work to set these guys up. They are not designed to be top filled. It's actually a fully sealed system. We cut holes into the top of the system um, because otherwise I don't know how we could even clean these barrels out over time. It was kind of a weird design. So we cut holes in the top, but we still didn't really want to top fill because my husband wanted to use this, um, this diverter system that I'll talk about a little bit later. But when we're talking about doubling up for these two barrels, they were not designed with uh, already made fixtures to double up. We had to drill into the side of the barrel and kind of retrofit in. And I wrote some descriptions here. You drill some holes and then you will caulk in what is called the bulk head fitting, which is kind of like a threaded, um, kind of, well, it's a threaded fitting. You're putting it in there, you're caulking around it to seal it in there. And then you're putting the plastic tubing over those, those fittings and then clamping it with like a metal clamp. Um, and so then now these two barrels are connected together. The first barrel is going to fill up. Once it hits that connection between the two barrels, it's going to start filling up that second barrel. A lot of extra work, a lot of extra drilling. I still, it works. It's great. But it was a lot of extra work compared to this, um, the first design. So it's something to think about when you're look, thinking about getting ring barrels is if you ever want to double up or even triple up or make a much more elaborate system. Um, just be aware of what that work is going to be to achieve that and as well as maintain it over time because you will be, um, you know, hopefully you need to maintain these, winterize them. I plan on taking these down and putting them in the garage for the winter. And so you just have to be aware that you could damage these type of connections and stuff like that. So easy is better. <laughs> so. I talked about doubling up rain barrels. I just want to make it clear that you can collect a ton of water from a nice rain event. So just an example here, we have about 270 square feet, I would say that is being drained into these two brown rain barrels. The barrels each hold about 45 gallons each. So I have about a 90 gallon capacity that this 270 square feet is draining to. And then this is here is an equation that kind of gives you an idea of how how much water you can harvest in a rain event. So your roof area in feet squared times the precipitation amount in inches um, times this you know, conversion factor, and you'll get 168 gallons in a one inch rain event off of this part of my roof. And so I could put four of those rain barrels here and still have like, eight, I don't know, like eight gallons, like, I don't know, uh, that's not right, but I would still have, you know, potential lost rain harvest needs there. So I think it's interesting how how much rain we really get and how much it contributes to gallons and runoff. And these rain barrels, they can help, but, uh, you know, you still, it's not capturing everything in most of our rain events. Um, so some issues to watch for when you are, um, working with rain barrels. So cover your rain barrel. So these particular brown ones have this filter on the top. You can see on the left one there, and then it's removed here on the right one. Um, you wanna have it covered because otherwise, you know, it's just open water. You could have mosquitoes grow in there. Um, animals could fall in there. Children could potentially get access into there. So cover your rain barrel. Um, with mosquitoes, I have never had any issues with them so far with how I've been covering them. Um, but you can buy chemicals to, to treat the water to prevent mosquitoes. However, if you drain your barrels every week, um, mosquito larvae, they need a full week to complete their life cycle. And so if you drain it every week, there's no way for them to complete that life cycle in time. So, you know, if you don't want to resort to chemicals, but I haven't had any issues with it. So. Um, just keep that in mind if you do have a rain barrel design that allows mosquitoes to get access, uh, that could be a problem that you would be dealing with. Um, probably the more common problem would be um, algae growth. 
Um, it's enhanced by sunlight. I haven't really noticed it with these brown barrels because they're pretty dark and I don't think sunlight penetrates into them very well but also they're dark and I can't see into them very well. So maybe when I go to empty them, <laughs> when the winter comes around, I'm gonna realize they're much dirtier than I thought. But at this point, I haven't had a lot of debris or algae growth that's preventing me from using my rain barrels the way I want to. We're not drinking from these. Don't drink from these. Don't give it to your dogs. Um, you know, just use it for plants. But um, it's been working so far for me. But yes, please please cover your rain barrel to prevent these problems. It's very easy to cover your rain barrel, so please do it. Um, I think probably the more tricky problem to deal with would be overflow. Um, so you're modifying an area, most likely your downspout to, to put these rain barrels in. You still need to make sure that that overflow moves away from the house. Um, so uh, there's two different ways that we do this at my house with our two different rain barrel systems. I'll go into a little bit more detail about the two different systems, um, but just, you know, a pitfall, make sure you know where your water is flowing and not just in a, a normal rain event, like also go out there and observe what's happening during a heavy rain event. I think in our recent rain events, we have had some, you know, pretty heavy rain for, you know, short periods of time, I feel like, and I was out there because I love being outside in the rain. And I was just taking a look at what's happening here and just making sure that everything was doing what I was intending it to do. Where was it going? Water's gonna follow the path of least resistance. If you didn't design it properly and you're not aware where the water is flowing, um, it, it could cause problems. I would say in that first, well, both rain barrel sets, if you get a really heavy rain, um, the water can start to come out from the top of the barrels. And that is, I'm talking about like the absolute downpours of rains. There's just so much pressure coming through the system that instead of it coming out of the intended downspout or the intended um, plastic tubing, it's finding the path of least resistance is to come out from the top of the rain barrel. So just be aware of that as you're planning your site selection. Um, we don't always get heavy rains, but if, if it is an area of your house that you worry about, um, more than you know normal just be aware that that can happen with some rain barrels okay so a look at a closer look at some uh, diverter options um so we have two different ways that we divert our overflow water um for our rain barrel systems um we have a more complicated version on the left here if you can look at the downspout you'll see this black kind of plastic thing about halfway through the downspout um, that's a, like a Fiskars is the company. It's a diverter. What it's intentionally doing is when you have rain, it's sending it to the barrels first. Um, it's not 100% efficient. Some water will still like just go down the downspout, which is fine, you know, because it's directed away from the foundation. But it's it's intended to it's designed to send most of the water to the rain barrel. And so um, with this style, as as you get both your barrels filled up. Instead of the diverter sending it to the barrel, that water is backing up to the diverter. And then it's just overflowing in that diverter down the downspout. And so that is how this is designed um, for the water to just back up to the diverter and then go down the downspout. It's much more complicated to install this type of system. It's more expensive. It's a little less efficient at water capture because water is still gonna just go straight down that downspout. Um, and it does still require maintenance because in there, there is a little bit of a filter inside that diverter and you need to make sure that that gets cleaned. Um, otherwise, what you're gonna basically have is water is gonna get caught at that diverter and start working its way up your downspout up to your like actual gutter system by your roof line. So you're gonna wanna um, you know, watch for that. Um, so the easier method, um, you know, it's easier to install in um, just the barrel in general, um, as well as dealing with overflow is these brown barrels, these darker brown barrels on the right. They basically um, have been designed, um, I don't have a good picture of it, but towards the top of the back of the rain barrels, there is an overflow area. You connect the black tubing to that overflow area, and that black tubing basically acts, acts as 
um, thy diverter. And so um, that's what we basically have set up here. Um, just still a cautionary tale in a really heavy rainfall. Uh, look at those two black pieces of tubing. That's not sufficient to deal with a super heavy rainfall. Um, and so we have found with this particular system, you can sometimes have the water come up out of the, the filter top of the rain barrel. Okay, so rain barrel maintenance and winterization. So you're, there is some routine care and maintenance you need to do for your rain barrels. You need to check for the debris buildup in your gutters and downspouts. I mean, that's basically just general maintenance. Anytime you have a gutter system, you're going to want to be, you know, checking for the leaf buildup. But it's also important with rain barrels. Um, with the actual rain barrel, um, there should be screens. Um, and so you'll want to check those periodically to keep them clean and keep the system running. Showing you here a picture. Um, I haven't cleaned the screen at all <laughs> this whole summer. And that's the debris that, that I have captured on, on the screen so far. I think there was like a yellow jacket like insect on there. And then I think it's probably, probably some bird poop on there. Um, so I'm not too excited to, you know, do that all the time. And honestly, it's with this system, um, I don't think there's any system inefficiencies with the fact that I haven't cleaned it yet. Um, but if you have a rain barrel that has a smaller screen area, maybe it will get clogged up a little bit quicker. So you'll want to keep an eye on that. And, um, you know, once again, always just make sure that your overflow areas are properly connected and directing water away from your foundation. Hey, Catherine, this so cleaning the rain. Um, this looks like Go a ahead, good Nick. opportunity for a quick question right on screens uh, from the chat box. If you can go back one, uh, have you ever experienced a damaged screen? Or um, I didn't really know about replacing uh, replacing that, but um, any thoughts on replacement? To be completely honest, I, this is really the first year that I have had rain barrels. So I haven't had damaged screens yet, but this particular design, the, let me see if I can jump back. Uh, this particular design of a rain barrel, they have black, the plastic uh, um, spokes, I guess would be the word. So it's going to probably help prevent any type of impact, like hurting that filter screen. Um, but I imagine that is probably going to be one of the first failures of this rain barrel design would be my guess would be this filter top. I, I'm not sure if the manufacturer offers replacements. Maybe maybe they would sell stuff, but I also think that you could, um, if you're handy and willing to try, I think you could buy these type of filter screens at like a, a you know, home improvement store and, you know, design kind of your own um, replacement. But yeah, I mean, I, I haven't personally had it fail yet, but I would guess that this would probably be one of the first areas to fail um, on a rain barrel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cleaning the rain barrel. Um, so I tried to take a picture here just this morning, actually, of my, um, lighter brown rain barrels of what I'm seeing as some debris buildup inside the rain barrel. It's a little hard to capture, but you can kind of see that there's some dark, dark stuff inside that rain barrel. Um, so these were put up, I think we, Put, we put them up for the spring and like maybe early mid-May we put these barrels out. I am very bad about constantly um, draining them. I really like to efficiently use the water as I need it for the shrubs. Um, so I'm not always using every single inch that I get from our rain events. Um, so the water is sitting in those barrels for a little while. Um, we only have one screen yeah, there's really only one screen other than our gutter guards that's preventing any type of thing from getting in there. So this would, I guess this is going to be the typical type of debris that I'm going to see in these barrels. Um, but I don't think it's going to be terrible to clean out. It doesn't, I mean, there's a little bit of a smell, but you have to basically stick your head up to that hole to smell these. Um, so that's been my experience so far. So when I am um, cleaning these barrels, um, which I'll be doing this fall before I put them indoors for the winter, um, you know, this isn't like you have to do it this way. This is, I went on the internet and this is what some people say you can do. Um, 
So you just scrub it out. If you want to use a cleaning solution, there's some suggestions at the bottom. Honestly, I think I'm going to just try water and a brush and we'll see if that works well for me. And then if I have to use vinegar or Dawn soap, maybe I'll get to that extent. But I'm not using this to drink or, you know, do anything other than water plants. So I really only going to I only intend to clean up the debris just to keep things working well. If you don't take care of the debris, um, it can start to clog your spigots and make your rain barrel a little harder to use. So there is motivations other than smell and appearance um, to keep the system clean. Winterization. So unfortunately for us in Minnesota, winter will come. So we, we do need to uh, keep that in mind with our rain barrels. And so when you're going to winterize a rain barrel, you're going to want to disconnect it completely from any source of precipitation, rain, or snow. Um, and you're going to want to completely drain it in any hoses. You're going to leave the spigot open. And if you can, it's best to actually physically move the barrel into a garage or shed for winter storage. Um, but at the very least, you should try to just flip it upside down for winter. So. I have seen multiple instances of people online on like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist getting rid of their free rain barrels. Um, but if you notice, they will mention that there's a crack here or there. My guess is when they have a crack in their rain barrel, it's because they didn't fully drain it of water and they left it out in the Minnesota winter. And that's why there's a crack towards the bottom of the barrel because water, when it freezes, it expands. So if you're going to leave it outdoors in the winter, really make sure it's absolutely drained because it's going to be devastating if you look at it in the spring and you're inspecting it and there's a crack in it. It's really difficult to come back from that. So just make sure that you are taking the time to properly fully drain out all that water. Okay, well that is basically what I had for rain barrel. So I want to talk a little bit about some water saving tips at home. Let me just take a look at the, the time. Okay, we're doing okay here on time. Um, because you guys are interested in rain barrels, I hope that you're an audience that in general is interested in water conservation. So I'm just going to talk a couple quick slides about water saving tips at home. So some indoor tips. I think these are just things we all already know, of course, but sometimes it's just good to think about them again in case you're not already incorporating them. Maybe it's something that you can um, strive to um, incorporate in the future. So only running full loads in your washing machines and dishwashers. And if you're going to replace one of these machines, if you're not already using an energy efficient version, like those Energy Star versions, um, look to get the, purchase one of those. Um, install low flow shower heads and faucet aerators and fix leaks as they're happening. And so this is just a stat that I found online and it actually made me um, like just shocked a faucet that leaks 10 drops a minute will waste 32 gallons in a month and so that just makes me think about my kitchen sink if it's dropping one little drop because i was a little lazy of fully putting the handle down on that kitchen faucet i could be wasting a lot of money because i just didn't take that little extra effort um and then i thought this last point really just rings true to me right now turn off your faucet when shaving brushing teeth or lathering hands how how long are we washing our hands now with covid that 20 seconds recommendation if you're at home are you are you are you turning the faucet off for that 20 seconds that you're lathering your hands or are you letting that water um, run so just these little things at home can help um, save some water um, outdoors so this is an interesting fact about outdoors. Our water use increases a lot in the summer. It can increase two to four times compared to the rest of the year. And this really is because of landscaping and lawn irrigation purposes. Um, you know, we, we run our lawn sprinklers, we water our plants. So our water use really increases, really increases in the summertime. And I think we're all kind of aware of that. Um, and it's also, Part of the reason why I think we're interested in rain barrels because we could help try to cut down on this. Um, your turf grass. Um, really, your grass only needs one inch of water a week. Um, so if you had a neighbor that was running their sprinklers at all this week after these rain events, I, I don't know what they're, they're achieving because 
their, their grass is going to be fine already with the, the natural rain that we've already had. Um, you, it's best to keep your grass height to three inches. Um, it will reduce the water needs that the grass needs. And we show here on the right, it just shows that the taller the grass is, it has a deeper root system. And that just allows it to um, reduce its water needs. And it also allows water to better penetrate into the soil. And it helps prevent runoff of the pollutants into our lakes and streams. Um, obviously, you guys are here to listen about rain barrels. So that's a great way to save water at home and the outdoors. And if you are using irrigation systems, um, consider smart irrigation practices. Um, there are a lot of fun, sophisticated irrigation systems now that use smart technology. And so if you really want that green lawn that you want to be very efficient in your water use, that's one way that you can go about doing it. Um, other ways to contribute to clean water, I just want to make some quick plugs to other things that you guys can consider. Um, using things like fescues as a turf alternative or a bee lawn or even rain gardens. Um, so these are um, you know, a few different other options to help try to contribute to clean water. Um, there definitely are some webinars hosted by Blamo as well as other area water management organizations, watersheds that talk about these uh, type of practices for clean water. Um, I put here some details about why um, these three different other ways to contribute to clean water are great options. Um, I personally myself have a few rain gardens within my yard. Um, I am planning to incorporate some low mole fescule turf alternatives into my yard. Um, although as a new recent first time mother, I haven't had time to really be outside <laughs> to do any of these fun new things. But uh, there's some details there for you guys. if. Uh, um, you want to learn a little bit more about them. Here's some resources to learn a little bit more about turf alternatives. Uh, Bono had hosted a professor from the University of Minnesota that talked about, um, did a couple very nice detailed talks about fescules as well as just turf science in general. Um, for bee lawns, there's a great grant program that can help you convert part of your yard to a bee lawn. Um, in rain gardens, there's landscape grants that Bono offers that you can use for rain gardens. That's actually how one of my rain gardens was funded. And then I put here a little plug. Um, if you want to learn about any of these type of things, um, obviously you can, if you're within Blamo, reach out to Blamo. But you can also, um, there's master water stewards within all the different uh, watershed areas within the metro. I know we have some people that registered for this seminar from the Minneapolis and St. Paul areas. Um, so there's definitely a ton of master water stewards in this area. So that there's a link for you to reach out to them as a resource. Um, adopt a storm drain program is another great way to contribute to clean, clean water. Um, I don't know if you want to give a little bit more description around this, Nick, because you're a little bit closer to this, but otherwise at a very high level, um, this is a way that you can go to this website and you can adopt a drain. And what you're doing when you're adopting a drain is you're, you're saying that I'm going to help um, keep that drain clear of debris. As you can see, this person here is cleaning away some sticks, I mean, clean away leaves. You're really trying to prevent um, excess nutrients from getting into our stormwater system. Okay. Master water stewards. Uh, what are master water stewards? And some examples of what master water stewards do in action. Um, so I just, I took this from the website for Master Water Stewards. So this is a program I just recently went through and it's part of the reason why I'm doing this presentation this evening as my capstone project for the Master Water Stewards. I don't know if you guys can see my shirt representing here from Master Water Stewards. Maybe I need to back up more. I can't see my image um, here, but Master Water Stewards is a program that um, helps support um, people to become community leaders to help prevent water pollution and just help with conservation of water um, and protect our waterways. And so if this is um, something that you think that you're passionate about being involved in being a, like a leader for clean water, um, definitely check out that website and um, learn more about it. Um, some of the things that Master Water Stewards have done, here's a picture of some native plantings that they've done outside of a community school. A lot of master water stewards will be involved in making rain gardens, whether in a community setting or in their own uh, private properties. 
Um, they've also done paintings around the storm drains just to just make people more aware when you're looking at a storm drain that water just doesn't just disappear it goes to our rivers and to our lakes and so if you're seeing debris washing down there just realize that that is excess nutrients and it isn't it's detrimental to our rivers and our lakes and then um, something that helped inspire me to even do this workshop today was uh, there are master water stewards that have done build a rain barrel workshops this wasn't really an option this year considering you no know, covid it just didn't seem like it was going to be an easy thing to do but um this is a great thing that um has been done in other watersheds where they'll bring people together they'll have these really great donated um oak barrels and they'll do the drilling of the holes into them and um, go home with a rain barrel that day and so master water stewards have done several different very um, innovative type of projects like this. And so that's just my plug. If this is something that you think that you want to learn more about and maybe be involved as a, as a leader of clean water, um, master water steward program, something to look into. Um, so with that, I guess we have about like 10 minutes for questions. And if we don't get a chance to cover something, or if you think of something later that you want to talk about, have a question, um, I'll send out the PowerPoint presentation and that will also have my email so you can reach out to me as well with that. Okay. Do we have any questions, Nick? We touched on the screen one and the only other one was about the, those clips that attach to a hose. So I'll plan on trying to look into that. Um, you know, the clips there on the sides that you can. Are you talking about were they asking about like on this on these systems when you're attaching barrels together, like um, retrofitting? I will go back uh, right here. That clip that's on the left. Yeah. I, I think that, that's what we mean. Yeah, that clip that attaches that. This, do you see my? Do you guys see my cursor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like these barrels come with the clip that holds up a little hose that comes with the barrels. Um. But yeah, maybe I maybe this manufacturer sells replacement parts. This, I mean, I have noticed that too with that clip. As I lift out the hose, the clip sometimes comes with it, and I've almost felt like I could get close to losing that clip. Um, yeah. So it's a really nice system, but yeah, if uh, yeah. Here's a good one. What do you do in late fall or spring when your rain barrel's not out yet? You know, you've winterized. And uh, and it rains. It's one of oh. those abnormally <laughs> warm days. Oh boy! You know that actually is a really great question. And so, um, I mean, to be honest, this is the first year that I've used rain barrels in my yard. So I actually haven't gone through that process yet. Where, um, well, there'll be a period of time when you have, uh, you know, downspout, and you don't have a rain barrel at the end of it. So let's see. On the one here on the right, um, that diverter, um, so this picture on the right, this diverter that you can buy, I mean, I think they run about 40 or $50. What you would do in this system is there's, you just unhook all the barrels and the tubes and there's a cap you can put on the diverter itself. And so then that system is just, it's closed, it's done. So you don't need to worry about in that system. So I guess that I guess that's an advantage I did not discuss about this type of system. Um, so that would be easy to deal with. Um, you know, your water is going to be directed away from your foundation pretty easily. So let's go look at the pictures here. Okay, so this system, yeah, this this could be a problem because you've now you've cut your downspout. It's supposed to terminate into this rain barrel, but you know you took it away for the winter, and now you're either really late fall or early spring. The barrel isn't there, and you just have your water run out here. Um, what I would say is. Um, what you probably are going to want to do is um, buy what I would have my husband do and what we'll do is we would probably, we'll, we'll have to buy an extra little downspout connector, some sort of tubing or something to then um, direct the water away when the barrels are not there. Um, it's not going to be pretty and it's probably not going to be super efficient, but um, yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. That's something to keep in mind. Um, when you're looking for your site selection, 
and as well as when you're modifying these that you might want to go and pick up an extra piece of downspout um, and you know ready tried to figure out how you would fit it and deal with that situation yeah um, and if you have no gutters um, I don't know if oh yeah possible there well so gutters are gonna it's gonna make it a much more easy um, I guess I, I took it out of my presentation. Um, okay, well, okay, so yes, gutters are going to make it most, most efficient and the easiest way to, to channel the water and direct it to a barrel. But if you do happen to have a surface of your house roof that already kind of pools water together into a defined point, you could put a barrel underneath there. Um, there's also these things called rain chains that you can use kind of like a downspout to funnel water downward. But yeah, really, um, the gutters are collecting all this water. So, I mean, if you don't have a way to channel the water into a, a, a single point, um, a rain barrel is not going to um, be an efficient system for you. But there are some rough surfaces where you might already kind of naturally have water kind of pool into a point. Um, although I kind of hope if you have that situation in your house, you might already have a gutter system up to deal with that. Otherwise, you're not directing water away from your foundation. But anyway. Um, yeah, nice. And my my first picture that I showed was a house that didn't have gutters. So uh, yeah, now I think about that differently. Like that, that's a could be a little misleading. But um, there's one that came in. Oh wait, um, what what house are you talking about? Oh, way at the beginning. Oh, this one. that house. I it looked here. like it's all dripping off the roof. So, I mean. Yeah, it doesn't look like they have a gutter system that would set need, up. Yeah, yeah, not a quick, just install a barrel. Um, how about uh, and perhaps for anyone else who's who's um, got some rain barrel experience, like Joe, um, is there anything that you do not like or any lessons learned that you would do differently? Oh, for my rain barrel? Yeah. Um, uh, what do I not like? Well, okay, I'll just be honest. Um, I love the look of these barrels on the left. I think that they're very, like, to me, appealing. But it was so much extra work to modify these. And then we had to cut holes into the top because otherwise you couldn't clean these, but they, they market these barrels as having planters on the top. So you could put like plants in the top here. I think that that's kind of useless. If you can't clean the barrel, you can't keep the spigots clean and you can't use it then. Um, so I guess maybe, I mean, I have a very handy husband, so that's why this rain barrel setup is okay and it works for us. But I think if I hadn't had my husband available to help with this, um, that would be a big regret, getting this style of a rain barrel. Um, it's a, it was a lot more work to install. It's probably gonna be a lot more work to take down and put away and then put back out again. Um, so that would probably be um, a regret. Um, also these blocks that we bought from Menards, they're beautiful, but they were probably way more expensive than we should have spent on blocks. So, um, I don't know, I'm kind of a cheapy, so that was maybe another little regret. Um, honestly, you're just trying to get a secure base. If you want it to look very pretty, then yes, like, you know, you can spend the money on getting some blocks that you think are appealing, but um, otherwise, like, go to Craigslist. There's people that are getting rid of fender blocks all the time or old patio pavers or whatever. They're still functional and they'll still work. Um, might be a, t a couple more that we can squeeze in. Uh, what point do yeah. you decide to set them up for the season? Um, maybe is that like mm -hmm. the same time you plant your tomatoes or is it uh, earlier April? Yeah, I mean, I think we we put ours out probably, I mean, they kind of like the rules kind of like Mother's Day in a way when you start not having freezes overnight. So I'd say the second half of May is probably the earliest that I'd put out a rain barrel. Um, I mean, you have to think about when you're going to actually use it. And if you think you're going to be heavily using a rain barrel at the second half of May, then, okay, 
then I guess it would make sense to put it out. But I think um, next year, it would probably be the last week of May, the first week of June, that we put a rain barrel out. And then as for taking it down in the fall, um, I don't know, we'll probably be taking them down at the end of September because, um, I mean, I'm primarily using it to water flowers, and most of my stuff is going to be, well, flowers and shrubs. My shrubs will be well established. They won't really be wanting a lot of water because they won't be flowering or fruiting. And um, same with the flowers. They're mainly June, July, August bloomers, maybe some into September. So, um, but then they're starting to go dormant. You don't really need to give them a lot of extra water. So we'll probably take our rain barrels down at the probably the end of September. Unless we just don't have the time. To, maybe it'll go into October a little bit, but then you start and uh, starts getting a little bit and you gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. How about one more question if it's something else is floating around out there, but of course we're still in touch and we're still, uh, you know, active oh, and we'll provide our contact information. I think Catherine's done that already as she's reached out. So. Yeah, thanks, Denise, Edward, Joe, all of your comments and questions, and Gloria. Yeah, so you guys have my email. I'm going to send out the presentation. Uh, if you do have further questions, definitely send me an email. And if you um, if you guys actually have you know general questions, or, well, general questions, send me an email. If you have very specific questions about like trying to define your own site selection or something you came up to when you have your own rain barrel and you're trying to install it, like I'm okay with being a touch point for you guys to to try to troubleshoot any type of issues that you guys encounter. Just send me an email. Um, I'd love to try to help you guys um, figure out any type of issues that arise. This this was okay. recorded, so we have the recording. Um, and we have a feedback survey too that we'll be heading out. Okay. Yeah. Thank oh. you very much, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Bye. I want to be sure the chat is saved. Mm -hmm.